Hello, Professor. So I'm just really excited for this interview because I'm one of the guys that's extremely interested in uh, uh, the unseen side of jiu-jitsu, as I have mentioned in the prior uh, interview with uh, uh, Ryan Young. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, uh, everybody is like uh, interested in the jiu-jitsu competitions and all these new stuff. But uh, you are one of the people, one of the rare people who are who is still in the uh, like the like uh, training under the original uh, Gracie lineage of like the real jiu-jitsu, like street fight combat jiu-jitsu, and like maintaining still maintaining the essence of uh, how it has been for the, uh, you know, past so many years, like uh, how it has been created by the Gracies. So just tell me about yourself and how you got super lucky to not only train jiu-jitsu, but also do it under the best lineage in the world, like under the, the Hicks and Gracie lineage. Yeah, um, let's see. So I was, it was in the 90s. I was in Salt Lake City, Utah, and... Um, I was like a little skateboarder, you know, a little punk rock kid. Uh, went to a few punk rock shows and uh, would skateboard around like abandoned pools in different areas and was just kind of out and about in the city quite a bit. And, you know, um, in those days, you didn't get picked up by your mom and driven everywhere and had a cell phone to check in on. It was just kind of like, do whatever you want. When the streetlights go out, are out, then you, you come home. So um, it was a little bit different era than how things are now. So, you know, we, we were just, us as kids, children, um, We'd walk to the park, walk to the store, walk everywhere, you know, all the time. But as a teenager, um, I started getting involved in, you know, skateboarding and going to some places that were fun to skateboard at, but you'd run into not so nice people on occasion and um, got myself picked on and kind of got in a fight, a couple fights. So, uh, adult stole my board one time, uh, my skateboard. And uh, I found myself like in anxiety a lot about like, when's the next time it's going to happen? And um I even remember there was this uh, old record store slash skateboarding store called The Ranch in Salt Lake City. And um, I remember one time they had this magazine section and I was just like, oh, what if someone comes up from the behind? I was just constantly just in anxiety. And so I'd have to position myself so I could see what was happening. And I realized, I thought for myself, like, that's an unhealthy way to live. Um, you know, who wants to live in fear? That's not a good thing. I was like, man, I'm going to have to learn how to fight. And... Um, my cousin, Steve, um, he, one time he, he came over and he was like, oh man, you got to see this. It's like the best martial art in the world. They're like, so he showed me the UFC and told me about the Gracies. And it was like, I don't know, maybe a few months after that, when I, when I was having that anxiety and I was just like, okay, I got to learn how to fight and I got to, I got to learn Gracie Jiu Jitsu. So I went to the yellow pages and, uh, I think this was 94, 95, 96, somewhere around there. I was born in 1980. So I was like, somewhere between 14 and 16 and uh, opened up the yellow pages and I found Gracie Jiu Jitsu. And it was a guy named Pedro Sauer who was teaching, who's got his black belt from Hickson and Alio. To my understanding, it was combined. Yeah. And so um, it was in an area called Sugar House. Like a, that, was, that was kind of the, the subsection of Salt Lake City that uh, he was in, close to there anyway. And I would take the, the bus I saved up some money. I called Pedro. I talked to him on the phone a little bit. I took the bus, went up to uh, where he was teaching. He was uh, renting space out of a gymnastics studio. And I went in there and I, I took like a half hour private from him. And then I rolled with some of his guys and um, I was like, okay, yeah, I got to do this, you know? And that's, that's how I got started. And I, it was downhill. So I just kind of skateboard home and, um, yeah, that's how I got into it. So, and it's funny because I didn't ask my parents for permission. I didn't, okay. they didn't drive me up there. And I don't even know if I signed a waiver to be honest, but um, just okay. different times, you know? Yeah, but I just started training and then fell in love with it. And um, he ended up leaving, let's see, I went to Florida and spent some time with my brother. And one of the previous times you spoke was when was the first time uh, I met Hickson. And I, uh, I have a half brother who lives in Tampa and um, uh, there was a Hicks and Gracie seminar in Tampa. And so then I went and I took it and I got, that was my first jujitsu seminar ever. And I got to meet Hickson and, you know, he worked with me on some stuff and I told him that I knew Pedro Sauer. And um, it's funny because that's the first time I met David Kama, 
was at that seminar and uh, Hickson's uh, ex-wife, her name was Kim. She was a brown belt. And so it was comma, Kim and Hickson running the seminar. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, so that, 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 that's originally how I got into the Hickson lineage. And then the first time that I had met Hickson and actually funny enough, the first time that I had met Dave. Okay. So uh, you got admitted inside the academy, like when you were 16 and like with no parent uh, with you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy back then. <laughs> I know a little bit different than nowadays. Like, I think I was 15, like, Hey, I want to learn jujitsu. Okay. Like, yeah. Jump in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. And there wasn't, there wasn't kids classes. It was just adult classes. Okay. So you just looked yeah. like an adult and they were like, okay, jump in. <laughs> I definitely didn't look like an adult and probably didn't act like one, but they, uh, <laughs> at that, at that time there was no, I don't even know if there was a front desk person. It was just like, wow. Kind of like, yeah, it was really, really, uh, kind of informal. Um, shortly after that, he moved and got his own location, um, on a street called state street. And then it was a little more formalized and, um, and yeah, but yeah, but when I walked in, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, too formal. <laughs> okay. So yeah. why I'm asking you this question is like, uh, uh, like two months ago, I was in Pedro Sauer's Academy at uh, Reston, Virginia, uh, Herndon, mm -hmm. Virginia. So um, like, um, it was more like structured. I mean, obviously it's 2020 now. Oh, yeah. 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 And um, now the schedule is like they're asking the beginners to go through this uh, Gracie Combatives. And yep. then like, uh, you know, only then you can like sign up or whatever, like, you know, the advanced stuff. So was it the same back then? So was the, okay. It wasn't no. structured at all back then. No. Uh, in fact, um, it was, it's kind of a funny story, a little bit embarrassing, but um, I took the private, I ended up rolling with um, uh, one of his students, like a, it was a white belt or maybe he was a blue. I don't really remember. And um, I was just in like, you know, shorts and like a t-shirt. And not, not a gi. I didn't have a gi. I didn't, you know, I didn't even know if that was like a requirement or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And then um, the first time I came up to like a formal group class after I had started, uh, Pedro was like, okay, I want you to go with this, this girl. And she was a blue belt, like, like, you know, a, a soccer mom. I don't know, but she, that's what she appeared like to me. And um, he's like, okay, you know, pass her guard. And I fought for my life in this <laughs> poor woman fought for her life and we just ended up in this epic battle but it was funny because I knew I was supposed to pass the guard and I was like trying to do what I was thinking able to do and I looked down I have my I'm like so like a white belt you know you get the blinders on and you're just thinking like I gotta just work on this knee and yeah I, I realized I was grabbing her boob and I was like oh. and, then, <laughs> and then you know pushing on her knee that. and I've been through that yeah yeah, exactly. And uh, especially when you're a white belt, like you just, you just don't know what you're doing and everything's just so yeah. overwhelming. But I was so focused on not letting her come up. So I'm pushing her down and pushing on a leg, no technique, just muscle. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I didn't get submitted. So that's good. But I think she, she was probably like 40 years old. I was 15 and, you know, skateboarded, you know, six mm -hmm. hours a day. So I was fairly athletic. But um, uh, I, I think Pedro's intent was to go get your ass kicked by a girl and see the real effectiveness of jujitsu, but I right. couldn't beat her and uh, she didn't beat me. But um, anyway, I was, I was hooked. I was hooked from right from the get go. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, like in those days, like uh, from what I, I've heard is like uh, the way jujitsu was being taught or like even perceived uh, was kind of, I mean, not kind of like very much different from what it is right now. Cause like, the first thing, if you, if you enter any jujitsu class randomly, they, they like teach you something like a half guard or something when you don't even have an idea of what a guard is supposed to do. But uh, in those days, everything had a meaning. The guard was basically designed to like um, defend yourself from getting beat up on streets. At least that was the, um, the, the uh, primary objective of jujitsu, at least survive and like come come home safe. So, and also like uh, they taught you the fundamentals like, you know, sidekick and then closing distance, clinching, take down and stuff. Everything was like uh, street based or like self-defense based, but now we don't even know what the guard is for. Guard is for, and okay, just throw the legs around your opponent like everybody does and that's a guard. So how was the understanding 
and the way uh, the students perceive Jiu Jitsu different back then. And like uh, also in terms of uh, self defense, because like uh, I, I assume like, you know, back in those days, like you were asked to like, you know, uh, kick uh, like anybody's ass, like even the, the guys, like tough guys who come inside the academy trying to, you know, uh, you know, take on people thinking that they are tough enough to do so. Uh, so you had to be like street fight ready, not only like grappling or competition ready. So how was the training back then? How did they kind of tune your mindsets with uh, real fighting? Well, it's interesting. Uh, it, it was a martial art. There wasn't really any sportive aspect about it at all. Um, so like it, I was there to learn how to fight. And the people who showed up, um, showed up mostly because they saw UFC number one, two, three, and four. I think I actually, I, uh, in previous like interviews or chats with people, I think it was, I said it was the first time I saw um, uh, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu was UFC four, but I actually think it was UFC five, the one where uh, Hoist and Ken Shamrock had a 30 minute match. Um, but so, yeah, then I went to Blockbuster Video. I'd go to anywhere I could and I would rent the UFCs. And I've, I've watched those, I, I just watched them obsessively again and again and again, trying to figure out what Hoist did to win. But that, I was doing jujitsu to learn how to defend myself, period. Um, and there, they, I didn't know about sport jujitsu or that they even had tournaments um, that wasn't fighting um, for maybe two or three years after I trained. And Pedro said, oh, guys, by the way, there's this tournament in California if anyone wants to go. And let me explain some rules to you. Like, if you get a takedown and then... I were like, oh, there's there's points. Like, oh, that's okay, cool, like whatever. Um, but it was all brand new. So he was there um, to teach uh, self-defense. And uh, he even was on the radio promoting jujitsu. And um, I guess some other guy the next day called in. And it was like, I beat that guy up, you know, Peter Sauer, blah, blah, blah. And it was a bodybuilder named Lance Batchelor. Yeah, Lance And Batchelor. so then, yeah, and so Pedro ended up winning that fight. And um, yeah. But it was all about for us, like, oh, yeah, you got to do this. So if you fight someone, then you, you can defend yourself. So I didn't know about uh, a thing called sport jiu-jitsu until very much later. Wow. Sweeps and points weren't um, counted in rolls, you know, because, like, you're a blue belt, and you, I, you and I go against each other, and you're like, oh, I got to sweep. Like, okay, cool. I kind of won that round. That wasn't even, like, there was, like, submission or, you know, gotta, I, I got to get better. Like, it wasn't about points and sweeps and different things like that. But the way at that time, for me, my, my take on how classes were run um, was uh, it wasn't structured like Gracie University is now. And I know Pedro has aligned himself, uh, to my understanding, with Gracie University, and they have their full structure. And it's like, get the basics in before you roll or would let anyone roll. Um, it was all there. We we're like, hey, we're here to fight. And I was like, let's go. Like, let's learn this stuff. So uh, I rolled on day one. Um, and uh, it was just like, if, if you don't like it, if it hurts, tap out. You know, it's like, oh, okay, you know. Okay. And um, also, like, uh, I heard, like, uh, we had, uh, like, double leg takedowns back then called the Bayana and stuff. And, like, the old school jiu-jitsu stuff. So, what do you, like, can you recollect any uh, staple moves you had back then, which you never even heard of uh, in today's jiu-jitsu? Like, the staple no, and but like, no, because I mean, I've, I've only trained really under Pedro Sauer. Uh -huh. And then I was under David Kama for like 20 years. I had a brief stint where I had a work project down in San Diego and I trained with uh, Salo and Janji wow. um, for about, for about six months. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's all, it's always just been under Hickson guys. So mm -hmm. the stuff that I learned as a white belt is still the stuff that we're, we're like working on and doing today. Um, you know, obviously, uh, with half guard was never a position. It was just a transition, transitionary thing to okay. get the full guard or to get to someone's mount. Uh -huh. It wasn't really at that. I'd never learned it as, uh, like a fully developed position, like Eddie Bravo would have it or some other schools. Um, in, in fact, I remember I would, uh, let's see, I was probably about, it was probably about 2003, I competed against, you know, Bill the Grill Cooper? Uh, you know, Jeff, not sure about Jeff, Jeff Glover? Yeah, Jeff Glover, yeah. Okay, Jeff Glover and Bill, um, they came up together. 
but I, as a blue belt, competed against uh, Bill Cooper, and um, they were just starting to do deep halfback thing. And this was like, and it was funny, Hickson goes, because he was coaching me on that match, and um, he's like, okay, he's going to try, like, I watched him, he's going to try to get under like this, you can't let him do it, like, I don't know, like, you just can't, and he didn't have time to give me a lesson, he's just like, you cannot let that happen, and I was like, okay, and then so uh, anytime he would try to go to deep half, I would just stand up and try to just like walk out and turn right. around and you know face him. But that was my right. solution to it. But right. Um, but yeah. So the it, um, I forgot your original question, but like the jujitsu that I'm still doing today is very very similar to the jujitsu that I started with. Um, okay. Grabs from behinds, double handed chokes, uh-huh. and all the all the sport stuff on the ground too. But um, but how you want we like you have to learn how to, you have to be exposed to that to learn how to deal with it. You might not need to put it into your game, but you want to know, uh, be exposed to it. Like all, even a bunch of the Gracies would say they would take boxing lessons or kickboxing lessons so they could understand the setups, the timing, so they don't walk into a trap. Exactly. You, know? so you got to have an understanding of it. You don't have to be um, super good at it, but you need to know enough of it to, to learn like the major pitfalls and how to impose your game, you know? Uh-huh. So have you ever done this challenge matches? Like, did your professor ever like force you to do, hey, like I, I need you to go and beat up this this knucklehead that thinks he can just come in and like, you know, invade our gym or something like that? Has that ever happened to you? No, but there was a, a guy named, if you like going back in old school jujitsu history in the US, there was a guy named Walt Bayless. Yes, and Walt he, Bayless. Yes. Yeah. He trained with Pedro a little bit and he trained with other guys. Um, I think I like there's a lot of videos of instructional videos of him and uh, Dave Schultz. Yeah, or Mark, Mark Schultz. Schultz. Mark, Schultz. Mark Schultz and another wrestler, like I think his name was Dave Benatel. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so uh, he was big in, uh, you know, Utah. And there was kind of like a friendly, I think there was an actual rivalry, but it was kept pretty um, uh, friendly-ish. Reps. Yeah, but sometimes, like, the, I remember one time, um, and they were known for leg locks and heel hooks and shit. Right. Even back, at, back then. And uh-huh. obviously, it's not the Danaher method and all that stuff, but they knew that um, a lot of jiu-jitsu guys had a deficiency in leg locks, so they would they would focus on that stuff. And I don't know where Walt picked that stuff up, but he maybe he got it from, like, the shooter guys in Japan or, you know, uh, I don't know where he got it. But um, I remember one time they came, like, you know, like five, six guys came in from Walt Bayless and they were all these they're tough sons of bitches. And then we, you know, and it was like, it was basically like a mini in-house tournament. And, you know, it was like, okay, guys, we got to go. Like, and so, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a no rules fist fight. It was still just like, it was grappling against grappling. But, um, but, uh, and they were welcome, even though we had like, there was tension this is what I perceived. I wasn't one of the higher belts or like super tight with Pedro, but I could tell there was obvious tension. But it's like, yeah, guys, anytime you want to come in, we're happy to roll with you. But it's like, when you do, it's wartime, let's go, <laughs> you know? So um, we just we just kind of knew like, okay, they're here, like game on, let's go, we got to crush them. And I think they came in to be like, all right, game on, we're going to crush those guys. But I never had, had been asked to do a- um, Challenge match kind of thing. Yeah, challenge match. There was a guy way back in the day, I was still a white belt, and he was a purple belt. His name was Leon, and um, he was getting ready for an MMA fight, or actually more like a veiled Tudo fight, because there was, there was, it was more like back in the day of no weight classes and things like that, and so um, they would have him in the middle, like I think they, a lot of places call it Shark Tank, but he was in the middle, it was like a fresh yeah. guy, a new fresh guy, a new fresh guy. But it, um, Pedro at that time was like, okay, cool guys, anyone who wants to train with strikes or slats to the face, go ahead and so a, a bunch of us we would when just in our role it would be like slapping the ribs Combat like, jiu-jitsu. The, yeah yeah basically we weren't there to like hurt our, our training partners but we were there to like hey i can punch you right now you better do something move so that was just that but that was just that was just jujitsu. that wasn't combat jujitsu. there wasn't sport it wasn't self-defense it wasn't gi and no gi it was all just jujitsu. it was just right one whole, it was viewed as like one body of knowledge you know right yeah and so now is the real question. When did you meet uh, Hickson? Well, I met him in 95 and, uh, at that, that, uh, that um, the seminar in Tampa, Florida, when I was visiting my brother. So I had maybe a few, six months with uh, Pedro Sauer. I went to go 
um, uh, visit my brother in Tampa in 1995. So it's 15 years old. And then I took a seminar and that's where Kim was there. Hickson was there and David Kama was there. Kim and Dave were both brown belts. And um, uh, that's the first time I met him. I remember shaking his hand and I was, you know, a smaller dude, but I shook his hand. I was like, holy crap. It was just this like big firm handshake. And, you know, I think, I don't know. I might've even seen, uh, I remember my buddy, uh, it was my best friend at the time, Chris, he and I saved up money and we bought like Veil Tudo number one, where I hit like Pride number one, or I think it was called Veil Tudo 95 or something like that. But um, how did you get the money though? How did I get What the did money? you tell your parents? Oh man, no, well, I, you know, get a small allowance, like five bucks a week or 10 bucks a week. But, you know, uh, Chris, he, I was working cleaning, uh, like family friends had a company and I'd go in there and I'd do like janitorial work, like you know, twice a week or something like that. Yeah. Clean up and, you know, we have mow lawns and different mm -hmm. things like that. Just like kid stuff. And, um, but yeah, so we saved up, got that. Um, and we'd watch the video like again and again and again. And Yuki and Kai went blind and, um, you know, there's all kinds of crazy stuff that happened back in those days. Mm -hmm. So when did you get to like extensively train jujitsu under Hicks and like, uh, you know, well, let's see. I think I got my blue belt in 99. Okay. I moved to California and I had a job where I traveled all over. So around 2000 is when um, I ran into David Kama again. So I met him one time. So back in those days here in California, there was a, a jiu-jitsu tournament called Copa Pacifica. Copa Pacifica, and, yeah. Yeah, so it was put on by Clever Luciano. And um, I was sitting in the bleachers. I sat down. And I'm just watching it. I'm there by myself. And uh, I look over and there's this dude. I'm like, oh, I, I remember you. I met you before. It was kind of like, uh, okay. I, go, I met you in um, Florida, in Tampa. You were, you, were, uh, you were brown belt. You were with Hickson. He goes, oh, he goes, actually, yeah, I got my black belt now. I'm David Kama. I was like, let me get your contact info because I'm new to Orange County. Can I come train with you? And he was like, okay. I'm like, I, I got my blue belt from Pedro Sauer. And, you know, yeah, I, I would like to come train. And then. Uh, the rest is history. So I've been with Dave for 20 years at Purple Belt when I moved to San Diego and I moved up to downtown LA. I had like, you know, a little couple breaks and stuff. But um, yeah, he's been, he got me my uh, purple, brown, black, my first and my second degree. Wow. So everything yeah. from purple was under uh, Dave Kama? Well, from blue after blue, because Pedro Sauer gave me my blue. Oh, okay. So, uh, the rest of my, like, the, I was a new blue belt. And then all the way up to where I am now was, yeah, it was uh -huh. primarily in a comma. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm what's thirsty. that? <laughs> okay. Oh, it's just, it's water, but I drink a lot of water. Oh, okay. Um, so did you like go to school there in California? Like you went for school? No, no. I just started working when I moved out here. I met this girl, <clears throat> got a construction job, and then I ended up working at a uh, was looking for other jobs, but was doing construction in my 20s and then ended up at a financial company and uh, was like, uh, yeah, ended up doing that. Oh, okay. So yeah. what were the stories you heard as a kid uh, about Hickson? Because like everybody you trained under was like some, some way or the other affiliated to Hickson. Like Pedro Sauer obviously is a black belt under Hickson. Dave Kama, needless to say, also is a black belt under Hickson. So like what was the... Uh, they would have like always talked about Hickson and like Hickson, Hickson, Hickson. That's what Marcelo, even even Marcelo told in a uh, in an interview. Like, uh, who is your, whom do you want to roll with? And he was like Hickson. That's what I've been hearing from the age of twelve. I just want to like fucking train with that guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how was the hype? Yeah, he he he's like the Michael Jordan of uh, jujitsu, you know. Um, but you know, I realized I didn't fully answer your question. So the first time I got a, more extensively trained with Hickson was. Uh -huh. uh, when I moved to California, started training with Dave, um, Dave Kama's gym at the time, it, there was no Kama Jiu-Jitsu. It was Hickson's gym um, that he used to teach at. He was primarily in LA, but he would come down to Orange County to surf and then teach Jiu-Jitsu um, in a city called Laguna Niguel. So then when he gave the school to Dave, um, it was just Hickson Gracie, Orange County, and then there was Hickson Gracie, LA. So he actually had two locations at that time. It wasn't like an affiliate necessarily. It was like Hicks and Gracie. Okay. But we would go up to LA. I would go up on Saturdays, as many Saturdays as I could in the, um, the early 2000s. 
um, while Hickson was teaching and, you know, hopefully Hickson would teach a class or there was different instructors back in the, uh, back at that time. Um, and so that, that early, early then I remember, um, it's funny, like some of the, all the, a lot of the guys that I remember, they're all black belts now, but some of the, you know, they're purple and blues and stuff like that. But, um, they had different like instructors that came in from different areas. Um, a guy named Mauricio Costa. There was another guy named, uh, oh, Lemao would teach. That's uh, a Hickson Black Belt. Yeah, yeah Luis, he would teach. Luis Alvarez. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. There was a, a guy, um, I think he was actually a Hoyler Black Belt. I can, I can remember his face. I'm, I'm really good with faces, but not with names. Okay. But there was different Black Belt instructors up there. Um, Hickson hadn't really grown a bunch of his own Black Belts in the States yet. And then, um, you know, and then finally, uh, oh, Chris Saunders. Hickson's Chris Saunders. first. Yeah, first American black belt. Mm -hmm. I don't remember Dave ever teaching up there. He probably did, but I was never there for that. And then um, later, 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 like Henry Aikens and then Crone, they were teaching it at that academy and then it switched over to Crone's. Um, but, uh, uh, but anyway, so I would go up in the early 2000s on Saturdays. During the week, usually like two, three times a week, I would train with Kama. If I could, I'd make it up to um, Los Angeles and that was when it was in, um, there was two locations back then. It was uh, uh, Palos Verdes and they, it was like shared, they shared a space with a Taekwondo spot. Uh -huh. And then after that, he got his own location on, um, I believe it was Wilshire just off the 405. And uh, then I, that's where I'd primarily go, primarily go and train on Saturdays. Uh -huh. So yeah. um, how was training with like Hickson, like training under Hickson? Like how was the classes like? How does, he, what is his teaching methodology like? Because he's the best, widely regarded as the best. Like, you know, there is like a few arguments here and there. Like, you know, people like, oh, no, like this, these people are like trying to build him up or something like that. But like widely, but I mean, everybody that has like half a brain knows that, you know, he's the, the king of jujitsu at, at least in the 90s. So how was his teaching and his classes the way he teaches? Um, let's see. So, uh, going back to that time and also to answer your previous question, I had watched him fight and then Hoist Gracie said in one interview, Oh, my brother Hickson's 10, 10 times, times better than me. So there was always this like mystique about him. And then I watched him fight and all the Vale Tito things and he won yep. and the guys were a lot bigger and stuff like that. And so yep. that's all I knew about him. And then, uh, Pedro Sauer, he would just tell us crazy stories. Like, I don't know if it's true or not and what if I heard it from another student or Pedro but like he told me about some of the fights that Hickson had had and um yeah but he 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 could just like tap like go into a place and tap the whole school we're just like whoa but I was so new so this is so I remember as a white belt up on Wilshire no maybe it's a blue belt, blue belt white belt something like that but um I asked Hickson and like he's sitting on the side watching everyone train after class I was like yo do you want to roll he's like yeah you know, and then, uh, so he, he would roll with me. And I remember I was, he kind of let me pass his guard and I swing around for a straight or a straight knee bar and, um, he, he gets out of it. And then he puts me in a triangle and, uh, uh, he taps me out with a triangle and I was like, man, how do I get out of it? And he would coach me. And, um, another thing too, I really admire about Hickson is if you, if you ever get a chance to have him coach you at a tournament, win, lose or draw, whatever happens, he'll pull you aside and he'll give you one nugget, just one nugget about that hey, next time when that happens, do this. So very attentive and very one-on-one. -on -one. In group classes back then, they were always, it's kind of like they are now, like uh, the same way, um, kind of a standardized sort of warm-up. Everyone sort of jogs, you know, switches their hips, stand it like, you know, uh, gets kind of their body loose, front rolls, back rolls, hip escapes, and then some type of um, movement that's going to pertain to the class that day. Uh -huh. uh, standard like uh, bridge and roll or upa. Excuse me, one second. <coughs> standard bridge and roll upa. You know, all just kind of the basic warm up, and then some sort of unique movement that would pertain to some of the the moves that he was going to teach in that the, that class. And it was very similar. It was like a self like maybe like a standing move, uh, an offense move, and then a defensive move. You know, mm -hmm. and then it was just drill, 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 drill. And what would happen is people would like mess up and then I can't do it. And he would walk over there. No, do it to me. And he wouldn't just watch and correct you. He was always, no, no, do it to me. No, no, no. I want you to feel this. Like, let me do it to you. You feel that. Okay, good. And then, so he would work with people, but a lot of times uh, the class would just kind of stop 
And then we would watch that lesson because he was giving a little more detail or yeah, when that happens, you have to do this. So then you'd get another kind of layer up. So it would be like the basic move. And then just in the course of things, he'd break down more layers of it or like, okay, when that happens that you have to react, but we're not doing that one right now. Just keep it to this. Or um, yeah, no, you really have to move your hips more or like more pressure with this or like heavier here, you know, just different things like that. And uh, people would stop and watch. He's like, okay, guys, everyone train, you know, and we keep doing it. And then after that, um, it was a lot of positional sparring. So it'd be like uh, escape cross side for like 30 minutes and then you can free roll for 30 minutes. So it was like just one position for a long time. And back then too, we would have like, everyone would line up against the wall and you would have like, okay, you're on the bottom in the guard, bottom in the guard, bottom in the guard, bottom in the guard. If you uh, sweep, or sub if sweep or submit from the guard, you stay. And then if you, you know, you pass or whatever, then you're down bottom in the guard. So you very specifically train those positions. And the goal was you would want to stay down on the, you know, in the guard as long as you could and just sweep or submit everybody. Um, but yeah, very like kind of like, like focused training like that. Pedro's was different. Pedro was interesting. Um, the class was two hours. It was about a 15 minute warm up, 45 minutes of technique. And it was like, look, if you're going to train, you have to train one hour. You cannot leave the mat and you can't sit on the side. So that forced people either to get insane cardio, uh -huh. insane technique, or just be willing to tap out or some combination of the above. But no going in there being a bully and then beating up your partner and then running, you know, off the side of the mat. And it was cool too. We, um, we would just line up and then the, everyone would rotate. So I might get a... a 120 pound uh, girl that's her first class mm -hmm. or I'd get you know a 190 pound you know brown belt who's you know it, you know he's been training 15 years or whatever it was and so it was just it, there's no um, picking partners and whatever it's like learn to deal with different body styles and aggression mm -hmm. levels and yeah but that would I would say it was one difference that I saw from training with um, for the you know the year or two that I had with Pedro and that that, that was in the beginning the brief time that I had with Hickson but Hickson still teaches kind of like I just described it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's really, um, you know, I'm very uh, happy now because like it sounds like uh, the the way we train in our Carlson Gracie Academy, just the same way positional sparring, then like stand up sweep or summit. And if you're able to do that, like you stay and then like, or you have to leave and the other guy stays or something like that. And like, then you go for the free roll and stuff. So um, it's pretty much aligned to the Hicks and Gracie uh, methodology. Yeah. I was like just wondering how it was back then, you know, under the greatest guy in Jiu Jitsu. So I just yeah. had to ask this question to you to just see if it was close enough. Yeah, one other thing too is, I mean, we practiced, I mean, Pedro had us practice a lot of standing takedowns, uh -huh. uh, judo takedowns, um, mm -hmm. no key takedowns. And same with Dave Kamala, um, you know, having trained under Hickson. Right. And it was funny when, as a, I was a purple belt, I went down to San Diego to train, uh, to work for six months and ended up training with Salo and Janji. But I went in on the wrong day because they were sharing their mat space with the judo academy. Okay. And I ended up uh, doing judo with those guys. And they were like, how long have you been doing judo? I'm like, I've never taken a judo class. And I ended up throwing one of their black belts. And then the instructor was like, I want you to come train here. And I said, no, I'm, I'm just doing jujitsu. He goes, I think you got potential. Just keep, keep training with us. And I, okay. And so um, we did a lot of uh, standing stuff and on the ground. So that was with uh, Pedro, with Hickson, and with uh, Dave Kama. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, regarding the personality of Hickson, um, if um, so, the reference that I have, like something close to that, is like Marcelo Garcia, who is almost there. I don't know if he's like Hickson level or like more than that. I don't know because we haven't seen a match between them everything is as you said it's inside the head yeah. but uh if you see marcelo's uh, academy he kind of like uh you know experiments a lot and lets you tap him and like makes a lot of mistakes himself and like experiments and learns like very humble uh like he behaves like he's just another student uh like trying to roll and have fun and uh, he, he says he taps a lot and like lets people tap him a lot uh to, for him to learn as well but we all know like uh, Hickson has this samurai macho kind of personality, just like 
I, I think the closest is like Habib or something like that uh, in today's world, like that macho kind of like never tap mindset. Like um, I have heard stories that like nobody has tapped him since 1980 or something like that. Those uh, things are hard to believe, but you know, we know uh, it's from all these credible people. It's not like, you know, just some fanboys, uh, you know, trying to build him up. So you being a very credible personality yourself and like um, considering like all these years that you have trained under him. So what is, what is his personality, like his mindset and like... Well, let me let me say two things real fast. I'll answer the, the question. I think uh, I got your question. Yeah, go but um, like there's a lot of people who trained with him uh, substantially more than I have. So I had uh, in the early 2000s on Saturday. So it was like once a week and then mostly only with Hickson all the way up until Black Belt. And then when Crone was getting ready for his um, uh, first fight in Japan, MMA fight, uh -huh. Hickson came in. This was, I think, five years ago. Hickson came in and he would teach two days a week. So at 11 o'clock on Mondays and Wednesdays. So I tried to go up to every single one of those classes that I could every Monday and Wednesday. And then the following year, it was only on, um, I think, Wednesdays at 11. So two, and then it wasn't even the full year necessarily, but like two, two years of like very frequent training. And then um, I've went to a lot of his seminars over the last five years. Mm -hmm. And then I've gotten uh, private lessons with him over the last five years, um, probably the last three years. Uh, mostly. So um, I don't know that I, I can't tell you all those battle stories like some of these other guys had who had, uh -huh. you know, like world champions come in and visit and things like that. I will tell you though, five years ago when uh, he was up at Crohn's, um, I don't think he had really trained in a long time. He was just, you know, he just kind of was off the mats and sort of just, you know. Because of Hoxon. That, that, that's my understanding. And I don't know what else was going on in his life, but mm -hmm. yeah. And um uh, but you know, he came back and he was teaching us super grateful and it was like, just new things I'd never seen before, never seen before, never seen before. And I know his back was, you know, it's still really messed up and things like that. Herniated but, um, discs. Yeah. I think like seven herniated discs eight, or yeah. six, eight. Yeah. It's like, I heard same with Laborio, Do you know, the Carlson Grissy. Yeah. Yeah. And he's apparently got just as many herniated discs, yeah. but, um, uh, Hickson at first you could tell um you know he it, you could see the competitiveness let me just put it this way the competitiveness but I watched him I watched him tap like this was like you know five years ago I watched him and me included I was a black belt and you know I'm I'm not like I'm not like uh I have, I've never won mundials but I'm like I, I'll consider myself decent at jujitsu mm -hmm. and uh, he fucking smashed me. And then I watched him, uh, other people um, at the, at just, he rolled through like six black belts in a row. Bop, 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 bop. Mm -hmm. And what was cool to me to watch was like some of the guys, like these black belts in from Hawaii, some of his old time friends, um, guys that I don't know who they are, but he just came in and they would come in. And so I've got one sort of style and he knew exactly how to handle me. And then one guy from Hawaii was really long and like, you know, like Lanky. lean and strong. And then I watched that. And then another guy like pulling half guard and doing different stuff. And he stopped that and then advanced. And then, um, uh, yeah, so it was just cool. And I was like, damn, he still got it, you know, but he says physically now he's at like 10% of what he used to be. Wow. Yeah. Like he's what like, I hundred percent looks look like. <laughs> I'll tell you, I wish I knew cause that would be terrifying, you know, terrifying. But yeah, he's there to win. He's not there like to, to, we had a conversation about the keep it playful type stuff. He's, um, I do think, I think the way he approached uh, what you said, like Marcel Garcia, like playing around and, you know, goofy and this and that. Um, and then I know like Henry or Hiran specifically is like, yeah, keep it playful, man. Let people do stuff. And like, you know, I think why Hickson got good. These are stories that I've heard from people, but whoever in Brazil was the guy known for like being the arm lock master. It's like, cool, close doors. Let's go train. Let's do arm locks, arm lock, arm lock. And that wasn't necessarily a competition or like a role, but it was a learning session. Yeah. So I'd, I've never been told that he's been tapped in those situations, but I bet you he has. And he would be like, do it again, do it again. Okay. And then just figure all the nuances from when it's like at, the person's got 99% of the hold how to get out of it if there's a chance, how to stop it at like 
80%, how to stop it at 50%, how to even stop it from happening in the first place. Exactly. So he was just kind of like, he was like a scientist and would just like, you know, like just apply logic and science and drill and drill and drill and dedicate to it. He goes, okay, good. I know that the guy's on my back and he's got this and this. I know I I have these escapes. So I think um, I would only imagine that in those learning sessions that, um, you know, he's like, cool, like get it at a hundred percent. Do I have a chance? No. Okay. Okay, do it again, and let me stop it at 90%. Okay, I, I, I didn't do it. Do it one more time. Okay, I figured this out. You know, and he would just develop the skills that way is what I, I understood. Um, there's even a, a story that um, one of his black belts said where he couldn't pass this guy's guard, and he was all, like, irritated about it. And then the next day, they came back to train, and then he passed his guard quickly. He was like, I want you fresh. I want the best guard that you have. Let's go. And then he figured out the different ways to deal with it. So he's just constantly thinking about thinking jiu-jitsu about all day long. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. Uh-huh. And yeah. yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, one of, uh, well, it's funny. I was, uh, I did a private with him. He goes, Jack, what would you do if this happens? And it was this weird like scenario where I'm trying to stand up and like trying, he's trying to take my back or something. I'm like, I would know I'd do this and this. He goes, okay, this is what, like, I, I'll do this. And I go, oh, okay. And he's like, yeah, I was watching the UFC the other day and I didn't know what I would do in that position. So I wanted, like, I figured this out. And I was like, you just, you're still figuring stuff out. Like he's still working on it, you know? Right. And so same with, um, uh, there was a time, well, there's a story when he was on the Joe Rogan uh, podcast where uh, Crone's like, no, this is a better way to do the guillotine. He's like, I got the guillotine figured out. And then he was like, shit, that's a better way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then he's like, oh, but he let himself get in it. You know what I mean? So I don't know that if they're rolling, I don't, you know what I mean? He, he's like, okay, put it on, lock it up. Let's see if I can escape. Yeah. And then he tapped and then he goes, now he had to figure out the new escape for the variation. So constantly evolving and looking at things from different angles. Uh And um, yeah, but uh, another time too, he showed me this thing on my kind of clinching. And I was like, I think my exact words were like, fuck Hickson, I've been training 20 years. I've never seen that. He goes, yeah, I've been thinking about connection a little more lately. And that just kind of blew my mind. So sorry, what was it again? Uh, he's been thinking about the the idea and concept of connection. Connection. Uh-huh. I've, been, I've been thinking about that a bit lately. And uh, yeah, I figured this out. It was just like, like it's crazy to me that him, he's still evolving and improving on stuff, you know? Uh-huh. So can you like um, share some stories of uh, like uh, you see him, seeing him like roll with some really credible people? Obviously you don't have to name them, but yeah. like, uh, can you just, uh, I have seen your, video like how good is six and gracie but i'm like greedy i want more (laughs) okay yeah well let's see i don't know it's kind of like that that, the story i was telling you about with those five black belts in a row Mm -hmm. like one guy pulled butterfly guard and then it was his timing was so nice because he just switched his hips and then passed Mm -hmm. and so that was one guy who was kind of stocky or like short and would get under you had like short legs and good butterfly me i kind of had the hickson lineage of style of jujitsu that really tall guy so it was cool just to see the diversity. And then, oh, um, one of his black belts, Craig Husband, who... Um, uh, Sorry, come again? There's a, one of Hickson's black belts. His name is Craig Husband. Oh, okay. Um, I'd watch him then roll. And Craig, you know, has been training with Hickson for, I think, 30 years. I don't know how long, but wow. a very long time. Yeah, like kind of like Dave Kama, like just a really long time. And so then... And they're familiar with each other's game. So seeing him just uh, have to deal with all different kinds of games and peoples and strategies and things like that uh, was pretty, pretty interesting. There was one guy, a visiting black belt, um, who came in and was taking a class. And then he could, he, his uh, bridge and his upa was not so good. I, I think it was the upa. And Nixon's like, you know, see, like, you're a, you're a black belt. Like, you know, you're strong, you're tough, you're athletic, but, like, your basics aren't in. And the guy got really offended. Like, how fucking dare you tell me? You've <laughs> never trained with me. Like, you saw this one thing. I'm trying to do it your way. And um, and he's like, I want to roll with you. And then Hickson well, was he like. he said that oh. to Hickson? Yeah, and Hickson's like, okay. And so Hickson was cautious and tentative with the approach and then just found his holes and then ended up choking him out. And he, he used two fingers on the choke. He's like, that was only two fingers. And the guy was like irritated. But um, I think it's a, you know, a valid criticism when you see someone who doesn't have fundamentals in 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, to be able to mention it, mm -hmm. especially if you're there to learn from that person. It's not like, you know what I mean? I came to take a class from you um, and you're there to get knowledge from the person. Yeah. I don't know why you'd be so fucking defensive in the first place. You know, it's like yeah. I take I would take a private from Hickson to find out stuff that I don't know that I could get better at. Yeah. And then if he points out something that I don't know or I could get better at, I'm not going to get pissed off at the guy. So it was a little weird on that guy's part. I, I, but, um, well, to be honest, like I can't even understand his mindset. It's like taking a math session with Albert Einstein. And like, you know, going and fighting with him. Hey, how dare you point this mistake out? Like, you know. Yeah. 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 I mean, if you're going to go roll or I like take a wrestling lesson with, even if you're a wrestler with, uh, you know. Kale Sanderson. Any, I was going to say, yeah, Kale Sanderson. Or like uh, any of the, the, the people regarded as like as some of the best Dan Cable, whatever. And they they like, oh, man, you know, your single sucks. I wouldn't be like, oh, yeah. Well, let, let, let. I'd be like, okay, what do I need to work on it? Like, teach me something. And then I'll go practice. So next time you see me, my single won't suck as bad, you know. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, what else? Uh, yeah, just some, I don't know, rolling stories. Well, there's that one with me that I told you. It was like, yeah, he was mounted on me and he was going for a cross choke. I was able to get my hand in and I was just, I was waiting for his grips to burn out because I had too much hand in there. I knew that he wasn't going to get the choke. Mm -hmm. And then um, he was like adjusting and I, mm -hmm. I oop, but yeah, and I ended up uh, inside his guard, but my hand was here. Mm -hmm. And then slowly he just kept the pressure on and he's like, you know, with the cross collar grip, mm -hmm. the way he was doing it and put the, my, my, the, my palm into my own neck and his mm -hmm. wrist was on that side. Mm -hmm. So then he just choked me out through my hand and I was mm -hmm. like, damn. And then that was really cool. Cause afterwards he goes, Jack, you know, he, he, he can't just do this. And then I was like, well, what do I do? And he goes, you got to, he showed me a, a better way to do it. And then I go, but yeah, but now you might take my back. He goes, well, at least you're not choked out. You won that, you defended yourself on that fight. Now you have to right. defend yourself on the, the next fight. Uh -huh. And that's what, uh, there's a one way that we, we pass half guard um, that uh, you end up kind of like, you can do like a one arm, sort of like a bread cutter choke. But what happens is you put a lot of pressure on the person's neck where they have to open their legs. All right. And so there was an active competitor. He's been in EBI. He's been in some other things. Um, uh -huh. But he wasn't letting go of the half guard. He wasn't letting go of the half guard. So then Hickson finished him just with the, the choke there. Like the oh, in, like, in the gi? Yeah, it was just, it was like, a you know, the, the, the paper cutter choke or bread paper cutter choke. choke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was from half guard. He was putting pressure on the guy's neck. So he had right. to react. But like three quarter amount to be precise. That's what you said. Yes. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Uh, it was in half guard. It, it Hickson advanced it to three quarter mount, uh, or like half mount to three quarter mount, and then the guy didn't for at all, like would not let his legs go. But then he had to tap to the choke, and then Hickson was like, "Dude, you should have let, let me mount you." And then yeah. he goes, "Yeah, but then you would have mounted." He goes, "Yeah, but you wouldn't have tapped to the choke." So <laughs> exactly, survive the priorities. You know, yeah, you know. Yeah, if you're gonna tap or not tap, okay, then you're in a bad position. Yes, but you're still not out of the game. Mm -hmm. But um, and then it was funny because this is that same guy. And he goes, um, what, what did, do you want to work on attacks? And then he was like, yeah. And he's like, okay, take my back. And then Hickson escaped the back. And then just, it was a super smooth arm bar, this guy. And it was wow. really funny just, just to see him go like, th th there was no space. And I wish I could, like, just out of respect for what happens in training, stays in training. But I've heard that that guy has told that same story. So I, I so want to get you yeah, email. He didn't, uh, I don't, uh, he doesn't know me. So if I shot him an email, he'd be like, who the hell is this guy asking me about? But, um, uh, but I've heard that he's told that story before. But. but but do you think like when these guys get a chance to roll with Hickson or like do some positional stuff, do you think like they went like 100% like trying to kill him or were they like trying to show him some respect? What do you think like from what you've seen? I'm sure both have happened. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, I, I feel like. But the age uh, matters. Up to some extent, oh. at least. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Like, 100%. If yeah. you watch Hickson roll with Alio um, in those videos down in Brazil, yeah, he's not trying to fuck up Alio. You yeah. know what I mean? They just want to train. They understand what's happening. And they want it more focused on technique. But, um, no, yeah, That's different people... because Helio was his dad. But all these, like, non-believers, they just want to, like, fuck up Hickson, maybe, like, potentially, and show them and be, like, the first guy to tap him and like, and get a place in history, you know, a spot yeah. in the. Yeah, well, um, I don't know that 
tapping out a retired person who's got eight like herniated discs is going to get you in the like the first man ever you know what i mean it's like right like like i i would love to go play basketball with will chamberlain right now you know he might be on crutches and i'm like oh you know he the guy scored 100 points in the a basketball game, he, you know, I could, I ran circles around him. He's like, okay, dude. So I don't think that's the point now, but I think when Hickson was in his prime and a, a little bit after his prime, I do think that those stories are true. Um, I have a lot of firsthand accounts from people who were there that saw it. Mm-hmm. And um, I just know how clean his technique is uh, even presently as of like right before COVID, I had a private with him wow. and blew me the fuck away and just like saw shit that I've never seen before, felt it different than I'd seen it before. And it was just like, where was this? You know, like, Does he nobody ever that? showed me this. Um, I don't think he rolls competitive. No, but mm-hmm. he would do like, um, uh, okay, inside my guard. Okay, pass, go. But it, it wasn't just like a free roll, but it, it, that was a private lesson. Um, I think there was a time where I brought someone up. Well, I brought, there was two times that I, uh, there was people with me. And then those people and I went really hard. And then he's like, okay, stop. And then Jack, come here, in my guard. Okay, go. And then we would turn it up. But it was about learning and not about me trying to, you know, fuck up Hickson. But with my friends, I was definitely trying to fuck him up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So yeah. Um, uh, how was this, like, physique like? Uh, because I, I have heard that this is like uh, no nothing to take away from Marcelo. We all know how great he is technically, but we also know that yeah. he has this gorilla grip. Him and yeah. Hajar, Hajar like nearly ripped off um, Robert Bryce Dale's gi in the match, and mm-hmm. he had like wear a new gi. So we all <laughs> know these guys have this uh, you know tremendous grip strength and like, gorilla grip. But uh, I know Hickson is strong enough. But do you think like he is physically a specimen? Or he's just like super technical and like that, that is his like strong, like strong. I think, I think he got blessed with both. Um, He is strong as fuck. And I mean, look at any, like, look at any, uh, his yoga, his flexibility, Uh look at his physique. Yeah. You know, and then personally, no, that guy is strong, you know, but it's interesting too, because um, when you're able to use your and this, like anyone who does like kettlebells or this is not just, uh, I'm not just saying like Hickson's like this, but when you have all your stabilizing muscles working together um, and your whole body can work as a unit, you feel three or four times stronger than you actually uh-huh. are. Yeah. Uh, the other night there was a guy, he used to wrestle in college and he outweighs me by a significant amount. It's like, okay. boom. And we're just like hanging out. He just rushes me and grabs me. But I know to put all my weight there and I lock my abs and I can sink my weight on the one part that he's trying to move. Yeah. So it's kind of like trying to do, um, if you're doing a squat, but then the, the bar goes forward and it's like, oh, it's like if you had perfect form, yeah, you'd be able to squat that amount. But if the weight starts moving in a direction you don't want it to, then then it's more and more difficult. So being able to use your whole body as a unit. The right then, direction. Yeah. And then pinpoint accurately, put the weight right where your opponent doesn't want it. Mm-hmm. you feel like superhuman kind of you know so it's like they're like it doesn't make sense how it's even like the hickson's posture in the guard so the way that you do posture and move your hips uh-huh i you like everyone knows you can break someone down if they don't have their hands keeping them up and all of a sudden it feels like you're wrestling an oak tree or like an eye beam you know stuck in the ground uh-huh. and you go oh well that guy's just yeah he's just strong i mean he's obviously just strong but i, I could teach a woman smaller than me to do it and carry the weight of my of me and so it's not that she's strong it's that she's got good technique right so but i will tell you he is physically strong and he's got very good technique so they they help and to be very honest uh one of the last privates that i had with him one-on-one um he's like look in this kind of position in a fight this is physicality you know he's like you got to be in shape you got to be conditioned and this is where you're like putting on the person so it was a, it, like, it was different than just the alio, just like wait and relax. And, you know, it's like, they, sometimes you have to make stuff happen. You have to go. Uh-huh. For and, the opportunity um, to present itself and then boom. Or, or just the fact that you have a, a, a time limit and, you know, there's like rounds or maybe, maybe you're in self-defense situation. Uh-huh. You got someone with you, but there's another person that might get to your daughter. Exactly. You're not going to be, do the alio grace and say, oh, I'm not, not, I don't know. I know that alio wouldn't have the same. You have to dictate. Fight. 
Yeah. Yeah. You're like, oh, well, I'll just wait here until he gives me an opening. It's like, no, you got to make an opening go. So there's plenty of times where you have to do that. So he's kind of like looking at it in context. And then also in like five minute rounds, you, you can't just do the, the old school tra- strategy of like, okay, well, this fight might take 45 minutes. He's got a five minute round, you know, so you have to be realistic about it. And then pride, you had a 30 minute round sometimes or a 10 minute and a 20 minute or a five minute, you know, like different things. So um, their strategy, but that being said, um, and going back to the idea of keeping it playful, uh, my understanding of his is like, look, you always, always, always have to play defense. But the second there's an opportunity that arises to kill, you kill. Yes. I mean, if you can create a situation where you have really good defense, but also in an offensive position, that's even better. Like you can, you're, you're in like on someone's back. You can just bang. You can do whatever you want to them with the hooks in with their uh, belly down. Mm-hmm. That's a very defensive position for me because you can't get to me, mm-hmm. but I can still be offense. So mm-hmm. that's a, that's a, like a perfect scenario is when you're, you're protected as best as you can be, but you can still attack. But then times where, you know, um, you got to just play defense. Yes, defense, defense, defense. But the moment they give you a sweep, the moment they give you a choke, an arm, something, you, you bend, you take it. So he doesn't like the concept of just be playful because you'll miss your opportunities. And that's how I think he was in the roles. He didn't want to lose. But the second you made a mistake, oh, he'll be there to capitalize on it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I was on, oh, yeah. the, oh, let's just say, I was on the Gracie cruise one time as a blue belt uh, back in those days in Elio, I took a class, I took a, a couple of classes from Elio, but. Oh, you met him? Should, oh yeah. Yeah. It was, oh, yeah, okay. was very fortunate to have that happen. Okay. Um, but he was showing a guard pass, but man, the second my legs broke, boom, 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 his technique and timing was like right there. So, you know, he, he, he had really impeccable um, with the opportunity timing. was there. Uh-huh. He would take it. Yeah. 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 yeah that makes sense because like uh, him being a small man, like uh, and uh, considering the fact that he has been uh, in fights which lasted for almost like three hours, so he has to always like play the. Def- I being a small guy, I completely understand it because like when I fight bigger guys, I can't go crazy because if I empty the gas at the wrong time, I'm gonna be in like super deep trouble. So I have to, like play the defense, and once yeah. the opportunity presents, then like guillotine or like triangle. So yeah, but like I think Hickson's jiu-jitsu is supposed to be kind of different since he has gotten the physicality, you know, so he, he's in a position to, like, dictate the fight and the pace. So, like, his uh, style is kind of different with all this weight distribution because he had some weight to offer, at least. Yeah, well, what's interesting is about that is that everyone has weight. And uh, honestly, the, the smaller you are, the more important that is because uh, it's not like you've got excess to, to, to throw around and spare. So that where you put it and where um, what you use, it's more important. And I did a private lesson with my friend, Scott, who's 145, you know, he's not a big dude. He's a little bit shorter than me. And um, he, Hickson was like, you have to connect. You, it's, it's because you can't scramble with a guy like me. Uh, I, if there's space or whatever, I can smash you. So you have to be, have the connection. You have to keep your, um, any progress that you make, you have to keep it. So um it, it, trust me, it's not just because Hickson was physical that his jiu-jitsu is like that. It's very, it's a very technical jiu-jitsu, very technique oriented. But um, uh, you know, but also too, like people who's got long legs, you know, they're probably going to have really dangerous triangles. It's going to be a little right. harder to pass their guard. Yeah. But when they're on the bottom, they've got to move their hips so much further to get their leg in to recover guard. So there's like pros and cons to each body style. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, how were his uh, how was his approach towards nogi? Uh, what's funny is uh, I remember Dave Kama telling me he's like his no his nogi is even better than his gi, jujitsu. Wow. But um, but the, the I was brought up with the understanding that jujitsu should always work for self defense, and then it should be basically the same for uh, gi jujitsu and nogi jujitsu. The only difference is, is, you know, they're not going to have the chokes, but the moves, the setups and things like that are like really the same. And um, the connection and staying tight, it's the same gi or no gi. There shouldn't be, a, it shouldn't be like two crazy worlds apart um, when you do jujitsu that way, or you learn a jujitsu that works for both. But in my opinion, you should train gi jujitsu 
because I believe it makes your defenses better when you're on the bottom and I'm cross side on top of you. And every part you move is covered in cloth and I can grab it and stop all of your movement. And you're so good, you can still escape. That's excellent. If you're trying to get me in an arm bar and if I'm no gi, maybe I can just be slippery and sweat out and explode out, but I can't because there's friction. So I have to stack you, I have to keep my balance. I have to watch out for the choke. I have to watch out for this and that. And if I can still escape, with all that friction, that's good. But then a lot of gi guys, they get really lazy on holding the lapels. They, they just pull on the fabric, you know, to break posture down. They're not using their legs. They're not using overhooks and things like that. So no gi makes your attacks a lot more precise and uh, distance management um, more important, especially when you start thinking about strikes and things like that. So I think that you kind of have to do both in a perfect world. Mm -hmm. So this is my last question before I let you go. I think I'll be talking oh, yeah. you for a while. Um, I, I, I mean, this is like a uh, this is like a high school kid kind of level, uh, you know, question. Um, so I've heard stories of people telling about rolling with Hickson, where he slaps a triangle with his arms tied in his belt. But how is that even possible? That doesn't make you can be Hickson. I respect you, but how can you lock in a triangle, like? on a person of your size, like he might be like a blue belt, but still he knows something about the triangle, but how can you lock a triangle with, without using your arms to adjust or something like that? Like, do you think those kinds of stories are like kind of exaggerated or are they really believable? I mean, believable and they're, true. They're true, they're believable. Um, the, I know that there's a couple setups where, especially in a sort of an open guard kind of situation where someone grabs the inside of your knee, uh -huh. There's a, there's a way, and, and they're like they're like pushing on it. There's a way you can use your knee to break their arm down and then slap a leg over their head quite easily. Okay. And so you don't need your hands for that. So someone's trying to pass, and then they, they put their arm there. But the way that you can you can you can bring the knee over and then you bring I I would I, I don't know if this is gonna work. Um, if someone is like grabbing here. Like okay. that, I can angle my knee this way to where it comes across their chest. Uh -huh. and it's easy then to loop it over the back. So the knee's kind of here, like the, yeah. and then the shin's like that, but it's super easy to come over the top. Uh -huh. That's that is one setup. But his open guard, the way that because he's always connected to you with his legs. Uh -huh. um, so like the second he'll put like weight on you here, and you try to correct, and so now you're overcommitted that way a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that he'll not your time. It's like you can never feel stable. He's always uh -huh. breaking you down. So it's not like you're. It's. It, the, I don't think any of the stories that you heard was someone had perfect posture, mm -hmm. two hands here were far away, and all of a sudden they're in a triangle. Uh -huh. I don't think that's what the story was. Uh -huh. But it would be that there was a situation where you're going, and then maybe he kicked one of your knees out, you fell down, and then boom. You know what I mean? So he's constantly. He told me one time. He goes, Jack, you got to fuck him up. Like, meaning oh, fuck up their balance. Yeah, he said, like, mm -hmm. basically, like, they can never be comfortable. Because when uh -huh. people are comfortable, they don't do anything. And then they advance and they advance. So you always make them, like, have them to work. Always make, he said, in a perfect world, like, if a perfect jujitsu person fought another perfect jujitsu person. Like, if I was cross-eyed on you and I was light on top and my knees were tight, that could, how long could that last for? We're, we're, we're both... You could, you could stay perfectly protected and you, uh, the, the person on the bottom could be protected. The person on the top is light. We can both breathe fine. We could stay there for 10 years. Right. <laughs> right. But the person who's on top, maybe he puts weight on there uh -huh. and it makes it uncomfortable for the person to breathe. Exactly. So now you have an advantage. So the person on the bottom has to start working. It's free and breathing. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, or if the person on the bottom is sideways and he's kind of like, knocking you over a little bit you don't feel comfortable so the person on top now is uncomfortable uh -huh. and so now i have to react so there's never should be like if you and i are in a a, a clinch standing over under we're both perfectly 50 50 right but then if i sag my weight i sink my weight into you so now you're kind of here having to lift my body up and uh -huh. your structure's off uh -huh. now you're uncomfortable and i'm i'm at least want to be 51 and you 49 if I could have a 90% advantage and you a 10%, great. But there should never be 50-50. You should always be creating discomfort on your opponent, making them work. 
making them have to work harder than you, having to correct. And then they start making mistakes and then they start breathing hard and then they, and then you catch them because they're desperate. But when it's perfect comfort, we're here and here, we could do that all day. All day. Yeah. So, yeah. But in the closed guard or open guard, you're always getting some sort of pressure that you don't like that you're trying to fix. And when you go, when you're trying to fix yourself to go here, you're fixing, fix, and the next thing you know, you're further over here. And then, you know, so he'll, he'll, um, you always hear is uh, all of his black belts and people that train with him is that weight distribution and posture and connection. So if I can take away, if I can get your weight so you feel a little off balance, if I can break your posture and the, anything that you're trying to connect to on me, I can disconnect from it, then I've got the advantage. So you can reverse engineer that stuff. Right. You know? right. right. Yeah. yeah. So I don't think, no, those stories are absolutely true. And I, I uh, would have 100% Marcelo Garcia can do that to many people. Blue belts, mm-hmm. purple belts, probably even some black belts, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, I saw an interview with Crone. He goes, you know, how do you get good when all your students are not as good as you? Well, you handicap yourself. Or, okay, I beat that guy in five Line minutes four. last time. Let's do it in four. Yeah. And then put yourself in bad positions and work to get out. And you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Tell your student what I'm going to do. And then try to see if you can figure out a way to do it anyway. So you always, you can put yourself in a worse situation, uh, a handicap and improve. But um mm-hmm. That's the other thing too with Hickson. Just to, I'm trying to go back and make sure I answered all your questions, but I think maybe what the strongest thing about him was was his mindset and his dedication. Uh-huh. And uh, I had been told, you know, that uh, Helson had the potential to be the greatest, uh-huh. but he didn't have that mindset of like pure dedication to it. I think some other distractions in life were a little like, eh, yeah. I like that stuff too. So I don't need to strive yeah. to be here. I'm okay with over there a little bit too. Yeah. Yeah, he's more of a, like a party guy. The typical real that's what girls yeah. in like party. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, that's what that's what I've heard, yeah. and you know, which is awesome. So you have to just figure out what's what's important in your life, and then yeah. you know, dedicate. But I think like Hickson must have also done the same, like him being this handsome hunk, like you know, all jacked. I think he must have got a lot of girls and like partying, especially in Rio. That was uh, I'm, that I'm I'm surprised he didn't get sidetracked too much. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, that was before my time. I knew I met him when he was married, and now he's remarried to Cassia. Cassia. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, I'm I sure see them all fun. day. I see Kixon and Cassia all day because I'm like a part of his uh, JJG of uh, site. Yeah. So uh-huh. every day some video pops, and like I always see Kixon and Cassia. So I'm like now almost their family member, like seeing Kixon <laughs> and Cassia every day. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoy both of their company. They're both they've both been very very nice to me. Uh-huh, yeah. uh-huh. Yeah. So uh, one last question. Uh, is he still teaching? Like, I just want to like uh, see him or like talk to him or if I'm like lucky enough, get a training session with him. But I don't know if he teaches people like me who who's like a nobody. If um, But uh, I just want to like, because you are the only person that I am currently personally knowing that that knows Hickson personally. Like, that's why I'm like, no clinging on yeah. tight to you like uh. <laughs> that's funny well i don't know what's happening with covid he's obviously teaching because he's releasing more videos online right. so he's got a very controlled group that he's working with and uh i know that that's happening up there mm-hmm. so you know cassia and then what of that that uh, i think it was a chrome purple belt and i recently saw some yeah. other videos that there were some other people on the map so uh, he obviously is teaching. Um, I haven't been invited up there to train at that thing. So I don't know why those guys are training there or not. I don't know if they all have COVID vaccines. So I don't know what's going on and what uh-huh. his criteria is. But um, I would say probably um, a seminar would be your very best. Uh, and I don't know if he plans to do more seminars, but I, I think that would be your very best opportunity to meet with him. And another thing that I've, I try to do when I teach um, cause I've done seminars around and stuff like that. And I learned this specifically from Hickson, but he treats, I've seen him work with a coral belt. I've seen him work with his brother Hoyler. I've seen him work with me. I've seen him work with a white belt and anybody who's at that seminar is treated the same. Equally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're a paying customer and you deserve to learn jujitsu just as much as that person. Just you, you, you call yourself a nobody. Like, I'm sure you have accomplishments in your life. And he's, he, you know, it's like, it doesn't mean you're, just because you're new at jujitsu doesn't mean you're a nobody. So um, that's what I like too. If he sees you struggling, he'll stop, go over and work with you. 
and then the class will kind of stop and he'll look and be like, oh, like everyone kind of learns from the situation, you know? And um, so I think your, your best opportunity would be to uh, seminar. do a seminar if, he, if he's doing them again. Okay. Um, but yeah. like, uh, this might be too much for me, but like, can I get a private with him? Like by any chance, like, is he doing like one-on-one -on -one privates? Like I don't I'm hoping that COVID gets over and like everything is like back to normal and stuff. So. I don't know. Um, uh, two years ago, something like that, uh, he did like three or four seminars in the old Torrance Academy, right when, right when um, Gracie University left Gracie Academy. Exactly. Yeah. Um, at that time, Hickson did, uh, I think it was either three or four seminars at a, on a Wednesday at like 11 mm -hmm. and it was packed. But um, I watched a bunch of people go and ask him hey, can I come I'm in town? Can I come get a private? And I watched him say no to a lot of people. So I think he's trying to um, preserve his body and he knows that he can get jujitsu to more people, you know, doing seminars. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I can't speak for the guy, you know. Right, he's that's doing right. his own thing. Okay. I'll still bug him and ask him if I can get a private, but uh, I'm ready for him to say nope or like, yeah, maybe You're one day, someday. Like, yeah. Yeah. I'm like so <laughs> jealous, like, yeah. you know, at you. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, no, but yeah, I can't. I can't speak for the guy in any capacity. Um, right. But, that's uh, true. I, yeah. I would assume. I would assume that he would do privates, but I think it would be very selective. And you got to think too. It's like he's going to work with you. He's passionate about jujitsu, yeah. so he's. I'm put super time passionate, in. though. I don't have the the credibility that he has. I'm like one thing I can say. Like I'm as passionate as him. Like this might be too much, or I might be ignorant. I don't have any, I mean, like, I don't even have anything close to him skill-wise, but passion-wise, I'm, like, dreaming about jiu-jitsu, like, you know, doing everything in my capacity to become better like him. I mean, just try, trying to yeah. aim for the moon to, like, land in the stars. But um, yeah. I'm just trying everything in my power as a 125-pound guy to be the best 125 pound guy i i can't be as good as a 185 even a mediocre 185 that's physics that's that's understandable but i'm doing everything in my uh, capacity to become the best so i i also like want to get a uh, i mean like uh, contact him because like i keep asking questions in his side he just um answers all the site members questions so i just keep asking him but i'm not like fortunate enough uh you know like he hasn't seen any of my questions yet but like i'm just uh, I saw um, this Inferno cast uh, person. I, I forgot his name. Oh, yeah. Caleb Plank. Yeah. Yeah. He did a, I mean, like a podcast with uh, Hickson. I would love yeah. to do one with Hickson, but I don't know how to contact him. Maybe like if you just, just, just saying, like if you meet him one day, like just, if you can just tell him about me and like, you know, you can be a we'll see it, one day. We'll see if it's, a, we'll see if it's the, the right time and the place, but I wanted to finish uh, what I was saying earlier. Yeah, like, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. you, you have to think about his, his body is fucked up. Yeah. So whatever he charges for a lesson, is it worth him being in pain for five days, six days a week? You know what I mean? And he, I know he, like you see his posts, he likes to be outside and stuff like that. So he teaches uh -huh. in private. Can he not really go outside and like enjoy the beach or surf or swim? You know what I mean? Because he's like, oh, yeah, yesterday wasn't worth it. Like my back, you know? So yeah. I don't know what his plans are uh, at all. But um, yeah, it's like, if, yeah, of course, uh, you would love to, to do the interview with him and things like that. Uh, I don't know. I haven't talked to him in a little bit, but. Um, I can't die uh, peacefully. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, hopefully that's a long time from now. That's a long time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. Do you have any more questions for me? No, or, I'm done. Like, you want to say something before we wrap this up? Yeah. Um, yeah, I really appreciate the time um, for you to just, you know, talk to me and get to know me and everything. And then uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that you're passionate about jujitsu. I've gone in, like, you know, waves in my life. Um, I've always, it's always been a passion, but there's times where I get eager to learn. And then sometimes it's like ho-hum. But, um, yeah, I really like that you like jujitsu. Um, I think that you... You said you couldn't be as good as a someone at 185. You could be better than someone at 185. So uh, just work on your technique and, you know, practice and ask intelligent questions. And, you know, just, I would, I, and I would say just work on like a lot of positional sparring so you could really understand the nuances of those positions. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like that's what you're doing. Yeah. And, that's uh, what I'm doing. Yeah. Cool. But cool. I st still struggle with, uh, you know, size and strength with like, you know, like monstrous, restless, like, you know, 
the the best I can do is like do not tap. That's it. That's a win, though. It's a win. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and then what belt are you? Uh, I don't do gi, so okay. I'm just like technically a white belt, but I don't know like where I stand in terms of like no gi skill level. Um, okay. You know, maybe like a blue belt or something. I don't know. I'll just send okay. you like clips of my rolling, and you can just uh, you know evaluate or like say yeah, like, cool. Oh, you are this yeah, level. Like a, mm-hmm. No, I wouldn't. I would never do that. I could never do that from just clips, but I might be able to see something technical that I could help you with. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 We should stay in touch. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you well, we're obviously friends on Instagram, and uh, yeah, if uh, yeah, if you ever need anything, shoot me shoot me a message. Yeah. Also, if you meet Hickson, just like tell me. I'll, I'll just <laughs> like you know, <laughs> just a video call. Just say hi and like kill myself. <laughs> All right, no no killing yourself, but uh, I'll, I'll do what I can. Yeah. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> okay, my man. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Um, all right. Have a good evening, and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. You're welcome. All right. Bye-bye.